standard deviation, beta, tracking error. So let's start with these. Tracking errors sound bad. You just want it to be as low as possible, surely. Especially in the case of ETFs versus index funds. How does uh, alpha come into this? Because there must be a reason you're taking on this beta in the first place, right? Yeah. Tracking error in turn then leads to the concept of tracking difference, right? Firstly, yes, the beta is some. The, the other big point is that So Deepak, there are a couple of terms that I think every investor needs to know and I wanted to run them by you and Vashisht. So the first one is standard deviation. The second one is beta. The third is tracking error. So let's start with these. Uh, standard deviation. Scary term because it sounds like something devious, but it isn't actually. It's just uh, the wiggliness of your returns uh, overall. That means uh, I, I don't have a straight line of returns. I don't have a guaranteed return every day like a fixed deposit, which basically goes up a little, little every day and then reaches wherever it is supposed to be. So if I took the average return on a daily basis and said, oh, every day is either slightly above the average or slightly below the average. How much is this slightly on average is the standard deviation in that sense. So uh, a fixed deposit has no standard deviation, but a stock market investment that goes maybe 2% up one day, 1% down the other day, the average of all such daily returns over a year is 0.5%. So the 2% number is 1.5% above the average. The minus 1% is 1.5 below the average. So you kind of take all these numbers and observations and uh, run the calculations and you say oh they might if my standard deviation is high that means some of my numbers are very far away from the average that means I have had average only 1% returns but some day was plus 10% some day was minus 9% scary stuff the plus 10% is nice but minus 9% is scary so you look at this and say well you know what this is really wiggly versus this is not so wiggly that is I think the concept of a standard deviation okay and standard deviation then immediately feeds into the concept of uh, beta or beta if you're in the US, which means something else here entirely. But doesn't it? Yes. It uh, Firstly, yes, uh, beta is some. And, but uh, uh, the, the other big point is that beta is just saying, in standard deviation, I look at the absoluteness of those returns. That means again, zero. That means uh, I was zero plus two percent, zero minus two percent. But what if I just simply said, listen, there is something that I'm comparing against, which is the index. The index moves up by say one percent uh, on average per year, and the returns of that index. Uh, uh, what is my uh, return in comparison with that? If the index were to go up one percent, what potentially could my return be? The answer is, if I am also plus one percent, my uh, beta is one. That means I'm one x the index. Uh, if I am going up 1.5% every time the index goes up 1.5% and similarly on the bottom, on, on the below, I will actually say I have a beta of 1.5. So the more beta I have, the higher I move away from that index. You want something with high beta on the upside because when markets go up, I want more than the market. But you're scared of high beta on the downside because you're like, oh, if the market falls 1%, I'm going to fall 1.5%. If the market falls 10%, I'm going to fall 15 This sounds scary. So it's a little bit of, oh, high beta means I'm trying to get higher returns in the index, but I'm sacrificing something in the when the market falls. So I have to know that uh, in advance. That's what the beta actually means. Vashish, you had done some work on looking at high beta as a strategy, right? And how does uh, alpha come into this? Because there must be a reason you're taking on be this beta in the first place, right? Yeah, so if you look at all factors, I think high beta is one of the worst performing factors. Uh, Nifty indices has one called a high beta index. If you look plot its performance versus a Nifty, you'll see it's done really, really poorly. So um, in any portfolio, most fund managers would try to avoid high beta stocks in them. Now, beta, if like Deepak was explaining, it's relative to something. So if you were to take um, a benchmark and a fund and take the daily returns, on the x-axis, you put the benchmark's daily returns. On the y-axis, you have the fund's daily returns and you plot the uh, scatter plot. You do a best fit line. The slope of that line is beta. And where there's a y-intercept, that's your alpha. 
so you want alpha and the beta is in pursuit of the alpha so if you want high alpha uh, and you want low beta you don't want very high beta with high alpha i think that will work depends on your risk appetite but uh, that's the way to understand these two things alpha will uh, is why most active fund management exists um and uh, these are all relative measures versus something in fact i'll i'll add another layer to this i'll say that it's not always advisable to only look for low numbers because you want high returns so you want your let us say i'm consistently doing more 1% or 2% more uh, than the index but i'm sometimes it's 0.5% sometimes it's 1% but i'm always above i get penalized with a high standard deviation simply because uh, my average my, my positions even though they are doing better than the index all the time i don't get the benefit of saying oh i always did better than the index just by different percentages each day uh, so it's not necessarily true and then it's beta is a comparison index right so you have an issue i'll give an analogy uh, indian children by who or some some kind of studies are considered to be stunted now i went in and said what do you mean indian children are stunted well, you know it's not it doesn't sound like it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's such a bad this thing if or not it's a statistical problem they've taken the average of a few countries as a reference benchmark in that sense these are countries like netherlands and a few other places where people are relatively taller so that taller becomes your average indians even adult males and adult uh, females are below that average on general considerably below in case of women a little more below a little below in case of men so children are naturally going to be below averages world averages in general so that means indian children are not stunted if you look at indian averages but it is stunted in respect to a few countries that you have used as a parameter and therefore uh, you know your your concept of whether you're stunted or not comes from what benchmark you took in the first place so you choose the wrong benchmark or you choose the wrong this thing so it uh, it it can change the perception so if i took indian children with respect to say southeast asian children we would not be stunted at all and some other country might look stunted in, instead so you have uh, technicalities here basically. building on that analogy it, if you bring it back to mutual funds then when you're looking at these numbers always look at them within the same category so a uh, standard deviation in a liquid on a money market fund will look very different than standard deviations in say a flexi cap category so in a liquid fund or a money market fund an overnight fund the standard deviation will be very low the volatility will be very low uh, and um, same way in active equity funds the standard deviation will look much higher somewhere comparable or slightly higher than the benchmarks okay this leads me to my next point uh, tracking errors so i tracking errors sound bad you just wanted to be as low as possible surely uh yes you wanted in the case of index funds uh, tracking error is nothing but the standard deviation as we've explained it uh, of the daily returns of uh, a fund versus its benchmark so you were seeing that if the benchmark moves 1% I am, uh, how much i going to move if we're talking error is high you may or may not move uh, 1% you may move little lower little higher uh, this plays out uh, especially in the case of etfs versus index funds etfs because of their uh, nature of uh, people are trading it in the market it's not like you go and invest and buy it in an nav um, so a market maker has to exist somebody has to create the supply demand uh, mechanics and uh what happens is etfs may sometimes on vol very volatile days not reflect the price of the index the index i think when we have these crashes it sometimes falls 5% the bench uh, the etf is uh, only down 2% so if you were an etf investor and trying to take advantage of that uh, volatile day saying okay now the index is down 5% it's an aberration i should be investing the etf may be the wrong vehicle to do it because it may not be reflecting it correctly so etfs will if you look at the etf traded prices and calculated tracking uh, error you may see it's higher uh, but what's reported usually is based on the nav of the etf which is a much more smoother number deepak tracking error in turn then leads to the concept of tracking difference right yes so the tracking difference is actually what i think would be more palatable to us because the number of tracking error would be 0.15 is good 0.25 is bad and in our minds we can't get around this stuff right so it's like they all sound like really small numbers we don't care we're getting we're supposed to get 15% a year what difference does it make if i get a 0.1% here or there 
but it doesn't it isn't actually point 0.1 it's a higher number but it is reflected in a point 0.15 statistical nerdism here coming to play which doesn't exist in most uh, uh, people's minds so a best thing to say is boss how much did i beat the index by you call that alpha at one level saying today i got an alpha of 3% that might be the this thing but if you look at an index fund Index fund is not supposed to have any alpha, it's supposed to have alpha of zero, but there is a difference between what the fund actually got versus what the index got. So that is the difference called a tracking difference. So in the sense it's your alpha, it's usually supposed to be negative because a, a index fund has fees that drags down the returns a bunch of other factors as well. But the tracking difference is essentially what you got versus what your um, uh, mutual fund got. Or sorry, what your, you got as a mutual fund and versus what the index actually returned. This tracking difference is revealed again on a daily basis. So you can see the average tracking difference to see if this fund is doing something strangely good, strangely bad. Good is a positive tracking difference. Bad is a negative tracking difference. But... Um, the more the higher the tracking difference is, uh, even at the extremes, then you suddenly realize there's something wrong. There are funds with tracking differences of minus 0.8%, which means if the index gave 12, you're getting 11.2. Uh, this is this is actually quite bad because 0.8 over a 10 year period adds up to a considerable real absolute amount. Uh, but uh, I would say that you have a 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.2%. That is pretty much where the standard averages are. So you will see these numbers change based on what. Uh, index you are uh, monitoring because it depends on the index construction. If the index has high churn, for example, something that rebalances every quarter and uh, almost 50% of the portfolio changes, there's a lot of transactions happening, right? So each time you do transactions, you will incur some STT, something the fund will incur. The index is not incurring any of these costs. And then you have the realities of trading. So you may not be able to execute at the best possible price. So all of these will have an impact. And uh, funds are real uh, instruments where people are putting in money, redeeming money and so on. So they have cash flows. So sometimes you may be left with some cash that mean you could not have invested uh, at, at, on that day. So you'll have 1 or 2% cash sometimes and that will add a cash drag as well. Same uh, a total returns index assumes that the day dividend has come, the same day it has been reinvested. While in real world that, does, that is not the case. Uh, the stock may go X dividend but the cash may come two, two weeks later. And then only you can reinvest it in the same fund. So those are reasons why tracking differences are by design. It's going to be there all the time. There's, there's, you can't avoid it. Uh, one note on tracking error versus tracking difference. A lot of people by default look at only tracking uh, error. I think in, in passives and we've done a video before with Deepak explaining on index funds that you should look at tracking difference. That's the main thing. Because you could have a uh, uh, an, an index fund that is consistently 1% worse than the benchmark and it will have a tracking error of zero but it will still have a tracking difference of one percent so just be mindful of these two numbers and when to use which one sharp is a measure of how well you do and the higher is the better right classic formula would be a return of the instrument you have invested in minus the risk-free rate uh, divided by the volatility does this also mean that if you measure something less frequently you will automatically have a better sharp ratio because there's just fewer measurements yeah, think of real estate, for example. If you have bought a house, you are not getting quoted a price on a daily basis. PRC grade. Could you explain that to us? So you rate these credit risks uh, into three buckets. Really good, sort of good, and, mm, and everything else. This grid sounds really nice. Is there an equivalent measure for stocks? I wish <laughs> there were. There is a riskometer. <laughs> okay. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Past performance may or may not be sustained in future and is not a guarantee of any future returns.